Hey everyone, Commander Josh Hawkins here. And at the time of sending you this broadcast, this is the view from my cockpit. Parked just below the rocky ring system of a water world orbiting a class 3 gas planet located 30,000 light years from the bubble. Much to my disappointment, interesting sights have been too few and far in between over the past two weeks, though I can assure you that it's not the result of a lack of effort on my part in attempting to locate them. In fact, I've increased my efforts tenfold over the past week by switching stellar navigation from fastest to economical routing. 35 hyperspace jumps now only brings me 100 light years or so instead of the usual 1000 light years. Yet, despite the extra searching, new places of interest still seem to elude me. My long range sensors are working overtime and I've spent countless hours scouring the galaxy map in hopes of finding anything that could give me incentive to change course. But aside from a giant star and the incredibly large ring system I'll show you in a moment, my current course seems devoid of any unique astronomical objects. Welcome to Exploring the Milky Way Galaxy, Part 11. It's very likely that the lack of unique astronomical objects is largely due to my location within the galaxy. I'm currently aligned almost perfectly with the galactic equatorial plane, and though one would think that the dense myriad of star systems around me would present more unique opportunities, I'm too far from the dust lanes and nebula to see any really large stars, and too close to the galactic plane to see any neutron or black hole systems. Since I first left the bubble, I've always used a distant nebula as my next waypoint for traveling across the galaxy. With no nebula ahead of me to use as a guiding point, I've taken to using the shapes formed by the distant dust lanes as a sort of north star. I'm hoping that in the coming days, my long-range scanners will be able to resolve a new nebula somewhere in the distance so that I may once again have an actual waypoint. But until such time, I've decided to relocate from my current position, just on the far edge of the galactic bar, and cross the 3 KPC arm on my way to the norm arm, some 10,000 light years away. From there, I intend to travel down the norm arm until I get close enough to cross the abyss towards Beagle Point. Now, I'm not going to say that I haven't seen anything cool at all, but what I am going to tell you is that when you're stuck in an area of space like this with nothing special showing up on the map, it's time to put on your explorer hat and really dig into the details. I really can't emphasize enough how important those details are. Most systems I jump through look almost identical on my first glance at the system map, with only a few that really stand out as unique. But there's so much I would miss if I was just honking my scanner and only glancing at the system map for water worlds and Earth-like worlds before jumping out. And here's a perfect example of something that would have been easy to miss if I wasn't taking the time to pay attention to those details. What at first appeared to be just another system with some high metal and metal rich planets orbiting their parent star and a group of gas planets further out proved to be much more interesting once I looked at the details of the planets it contained. And it took me a moment to process the information I was seeing. The size and mass of the rings orbiting the closest of those gas planets were higher than anything I had ever come across. I turned my ship to face the planet, and even from the center of the system, some 1600 light seconds away, they were visible. Bold, bright white rings orbited this unsuspecting gas planet, spanning a distance of almost 2.2 million kilometers in radius, and containing over 72 trillion metric tons of material. Let me just put this into perspective for a second. The largest dump truck on Earth during the 21st century was the Caterpillar 797F. This massive 15 meter long beast of a machine sported the world's largest tires that themselves weighed in at 5.1 metric tons each and stood over 4 meters tall. The Caterpillar 797F had six of these tires which allowed it to carry 400 short tons of weight. In order to carry all the ice in the large ring around this planet, you would need about 209 billion Caterpillar 797Fs. 
If you had all those dump trucks in a line waiting to be filled, the line would be over 3 billion kilometers long and would circle Earth's orbit around the sun over three times. Aside from being the largest ring system I've ever seen, what made it even more interesting was that there was a huge gap of almost a million kilometers between the first and second rings of the planet, and nestled in between was a beautiful little moon. The planet also had a second moon whose orbit was highly unusual, at a complete 90 degree angle to the rotation of the planet, and though I had hoped I would be able to land there and get some images of the ring system below, my surface scans detected a highly unstable environment that would have made landing a dangerous endeavor, and with my hull already at 67%, I just can't take any more risks with my ship, at least not just for the sake of a few images. I still have a long way to go and a passenger on board who I intend to see safely returned home. Speaking of my passenger, as I've mentioned before, if my broadcasts have been received by the parties involved in her assassination attempt and they've learned that she's still alive, they could have already sent someone off to finish the job. At full speed, it would only take them a few weeks to reach my location, and as far as I know, they could already be nearby, searching for signs of my ship or even using my projected course to plan an ambush. So I've been extra careful with each hyperspace jump, and have made sure that my weapon systems are armed and operational. But I'm taking a few other precautions as well. I've diverted power from my emergency life support systems to my ship's sensors. I mean. Really, what's an extra few minutes of life support going to do for me out here anyhow, right? And with a few minor modifications, I've boosted the sensors far beyond what they would normally be capable of. It wasn't too hard to do really, it was just a matter of coupling the Advanced Discovery Scanner's Gravimetric Distortion Sensor to the Parametric Subspace Field Stress Sensors and voila, a makeshift, long-range, high-wake sensor array. I should now be able to detect any ships entering hyperspace within roughly 10 light years of my location, give or take. I'm still working out the resolution details, and if I can get it working properly, I should be able to get a visual reading on my ship's radar display, if the sensor picks anything up. But that would give me at least a little heads up if anyone is within sensor range. In theory, at least. I don't really have any way to test it, so I hope it works. I've also assigned my ship's main computer a higher priority to active monitoring and decrypting of all communication channels and frequencies. It would be pretty stupid if anyone coming out here were actively broadcasting, but my hope in doing this is that if there's more than one ship, I may be able to pick up on any hailing signal packets used in ship-to-ship -ship communication, which might alert me to their presence. There's a lot of noise that I have to try and filter out, and it's going to require more time for me to adjust the transceiver in order to compensate for the Doppler and Heisenberg effects, since right now I'm still picking up everything from the sound of nearby gas planets to the cosmic microwave background radiation. But once I adjust the sublight signal preprocessor and the noise eliminator, the adaptive antenna should be able to effectively filter out astronomical sound clutter. So far, the computer hasn't identified any voice or data communications, which is a good thing, because getting into a fight is not exactly high on my list of priorities right now. I honestly hope that all these precautions will ultimately prove to be unnecessary, but better safe than sorry. Before I end this broadcast, I have a request for anyone who has received this, and I should have asked already. Please. Contact Ken and Interstellar. Let them know what's happened. I've included the necessary data link to reach them directly in the descriptor for this communication. I know it might be a risk to you, but it's important that the events uncovered in Commander Shannon Day's logs be brought to light. The people involved are clearly dangerous and need to be stopped. And also, please inform them that Commander Shannon Day is alive and well. I'm sure that her family will want to know. This is Commander Josh Hawkins, signing off. I hope you enjoyed this installment in the series. If you did, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe.